You know, whenever we get exposed to an environment like this, we're going to start conveying information to people who may have questions or wondering mm -hmm. about their past or their futures. Um, I can't help but think of Jacqueline de Chaper. You ever heard of Jacqueline? No, I haven't. Uh, she was a delightful young French woman who came to this country several years ago. And in an effort to get a job, she had to go to the Northwest. And she went to the lumber camps. And even though she was petite, she went there to get a job as a chopper. And you can imagine how these big, muscular, tattooed, buff guys handled that. Oh, ho, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what is it? You, where have you chopped before? <laughs> and she said, well, my last big job was the Sahara Forest. And they said, well, Sahara Forest? That's not the Sahara Forest. That's Sahara Desert. And she said, well, yeah, now. Okay. I see. Yeah. And so, uh, sure enough, they hired her. And uh, she was good, really good. And some time passed, and came time for the international contests. And um, she entered, made it through the quarterfinals, semifinals, and here she was, the final. She against one young athlete, okay, who was going to be the best chopper in the world. And so the contest was a one of stamina and durability, and it went from 10 to 1. And at 10 o'clock, the whistle blew and the chips flew. And I mean, they kept, kept pace pretty well. Jacqueline pulled a little bit of a head. And all of a sudden, she just left the scene, just walked away. Hmm. And the young man continued, and of course, got ahead. And later, she returned, began to chop, and caught up. And then, again, she walked away and was gone for a considerable amount of time, as though she were taking lunch or something. And she came back and caught up. And then later, she went away again came back, and we wouldn't be talking about this unless she what? Won the contest. Right. And the camera crews were there, and the press, and her friends, and peers, and they were applauding and saying, how in the world did you do that? You kept taking those breaks. We don't understand. She says, I wasn't taking a break. I was what? I was out shopping the axe. Oh, wow. You see? And, you know, that story has been told since time immemorial uh, by people who are selling seminars. Um, exhorting us to come to the seminar, to take time out to sharpen the axe. And it makes sense, good sense. There's no question that life and its toils and troubles can cause us to get dull, can put barbs on our edge, you know? And sometimes we can work a lot harder than it seems we should have to to get the job done. Uh, but you know, there's more to that than meets the eye. Uh, as a young man, I worked in uh, New Hampshire forests as a lumberjack, a very young one. Um, but in the beginning, I was allowed to brush and to limb trees and what have you, and was part of that whole process. And uh, always wanted to make a contribution if I could. Always wanted to please my dad. And so one day I figured, well, I'll, I'll sharpen the axe. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. And so I uh, got the axe out. And you know, it's really funny sometimes. I've used the axe as part of an illustration as to what we do. Um, and someone in Pennsylvania one time was kind enough to identify me as a honing stone. You know, and I always thought that was quite flattering. And so anyway, uh, I broke out the axe and I went to this grindstone. A grindstone, you know, is around this way and it has this thing. And this particular one was mounted in a wood frame and it had, um, oh, a pedal on it, a little seat, a little bucket of water where you poured water in the stone so it wouldn't get too hot. And I'd seen my dad do this a lot, so I sat down and I spun the wheel and began to sharpen the axe. Okay? And the wheel was spinning this way, and little sparks were flying, and it sounded right, it looked right, the edge was shiny, it felt sharp, because everything seemed to be okay. And he came out and he said, funny face, I don't know why you call me funny face, I do really, but that's another <laughs> issue. Uh, he came out and said, I really appreciate what you're trying to do, but you're doing it wrong. And I didn't understand because everything seemed right. Okay? He said, look, you're spinning the stone away from you, and that actually turns the edge. Now, it sounds right and looks right, but the edge won't endure that way. What you have to do, he said, is to sit down and spin the wheel towards you, keep it pumping, and there's a confrontation that has to occur in order to knock off the barbs and to smooth the edge and to put a proper edge on it that'll be durable. Okay? It's a little bit different than we would expect. It's a different perspective. Um, another thing, he said that you can't hold the axe too flat, too acute, because it puts too fine an edge, it'll turn easily. Or, of course, if you put it too abrupt, it dulls the edge. It has to be just the right position. And, you know, it seems to me over the years, um, 
that we've been presenting ourselves to honing stones that were spinning the wrong way. Frankly, I think of them as motivational speakers, the ones who exhort, who excite. You know what I mean? They tell us what we can do and what's been done and that, let's go do it. And it's stimulating, there's no question. And yet old Monday morning comes around and we can't find a matching pair of socks, the edge goes dull, and we wonder what we're supposed to do next. You know what I'm saying? And so it is time to sharpen the ax, but you've got to be sure that you're confronting new and fresh concepts and ideas, different perspectives, so that there really can be a durable edge. And that's what we're going to be attempting to do today and in future weeks, is to provide fresh new information from a different perspective, a different posture that can make a difference in people's lives. And uh, we're going to work very hard at it. And to think that you can be a part of that is exciting for me.